Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Living in the West. Now, Living in the West is a series of episodes where we look into the Muslim minorities in the West, aiming to provide some ideas to their vision, to their strategy while living in the West. I have with me Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad from the Muslim Research and Development Foundation in the UK, an organization which looks to provide solutions for this Muslim minority. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, in the previous episodes, we spoke about the vision, the importance of the vision. We spoke about how to clarify what vision to follow. How do we accept a vision? I think the next step, the next logical step would be, what is the vision that we need to follow, Sheikh? Or the Muslim minorities need to follow in the West. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursali, nabiyana Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. In the previous episodes, we have discussed uh, the importance of the vision mm -hmm. and the importance of having a strategy. And then we have spoken about the tools and instruments that provide uh, for us a way to uh, accept a certain vision. Because so many people, as we said, mm -hmm. speak about uh, some visions and some strategies. And how do we accept any of these uh, strategies or visions. This is important. I think now we need to clarify some further issues about the vision based on the Quranic verses that we have mentioned and based on the uh, prophetic traditions that we have mentioned. We said that in general Allah Jalla wa Ala says, generally speaking, we can take the vision from the verse, the Quranic verse, when Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ And we said that the ibadah is a comprehensive term. Mm -hmm. And it encompasses every sphere in our life. And we said also that we need to implement ibadah in our personal life and in our community life on a personal level and on a communal level, on both levels and as well in all spheres. So this is like a matrix now. The overall vision is to establish ibadah in its total meaning. And then we also mentioned the issue of tawheed. And we said that all prophets, as Allah Jalla wa Ala mentioned in the Quran, all prophets were sent to establish Tawheed and to call their people for Tawheed. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ عَبُدُ اللَّهِ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَّهٍ غَيْرُ And so on. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِعَبُدُ الله مخلصين له الدين and so and many ayat that talk about this. Now, we said that if we go with the first verse, which is, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ And the other verses that talk about ibadah, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِعْبُدُونَ We see that there are so many similarities, or actually, they are the same. Ibadah and Tawheed are the same. And then when we spoke about the other verses from the, the other Quranic verses, such as Kuntum Khaira Ummatin Ukhrijat Linnas, Ta'muruna bil Ma'rufi wa Tanhawna Anil Munkari wa Tu'minuna Billah. So this again goes along with the meaning of Tawheed, with the comprehensive meaning of Tawheed and the comprehensive meaning of Ibadah. So just to break that down for the, the viewers here, you're, you're saying that now the Ibadah 
the having justice, the preventing the good and the evil, all of this comes together and this makes a bigger, uh, say, a collection called Ibadah. This itself is a bigger sphere. Yeah. It's not to be taken separately. Uh, exactly. Mm-hmm. And this is the comprehensive meaning of Ibadah. Mm-hmm. This is the comprehensive meaning of Tawheed. This is again the comprehensive meaning of Khilafah. When we said, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً What does a Khalifa mean? It's the same thing to implement Ibadah, to implement Tawheed, <coughs> and so on and so forth. So, Ibadah, Tawheed, in all spheres to be implemented and in all levels, on an individual level and on a communal level. You're talking about a, a social, political level too? You're, you're, all the levels? You're no, talking, not no, this is... Uh, uh, well, let us imagine it as if it is a matrix. Okay. First of all, mm-hmm. in terms of people, on a personal level, on an individual level, and on a communal level. Mm-hmm. Then, within the person himself, now we have the social life, we have the political life, we have the economical sphere, and so on. Same thing with the communal level their community or the, the community itself as a community and then on a political level, on a social level, etc. So it is like a matrix. And once we understand this matrix, it means that we have encompassed everything in life under the term of ibadah and under the term of tawheed. Again, under the term of khilafah, under the term of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil and تؤمنون uh, بالله believing in Allah mm-hmm. again this also goes along with what we have mentioned إنا عرضنا الأمانة على السماوات والأرض والجبال فأبين أن يحملها وحملها الإنسان the amana the trust that Allah جل وعلا put on the shoulders of the son of Adam of the human being what is that amana ibadah in its totality so all of these ayat, all f- they all push to the same direction. Yes, and we and this is very important. We should not understand them as if they give different meanings, different contradictory meanings. They all push into one direction. And this is the correct understanding of these verses and as well as other verses. As we have mentioned last time, that all or you find rarely real a real contradiction between the Quranic verses, uh, especially the Quranic verses. This holistic now, view you're saying? This, the holistic view. Mm-hmm. Now, here, the issue of implementing Tawheed in its totality. You may know that so many people misunderstand this point, implementing Tawheed. Mm-hmm. And so many, thing, so many people as well misunderstand the point of implementing ibadah in its comprehensive meaning. Now, implementing tawheed. Many people think that implementing tawheed means you don't worship any idols. Or you don't worship someone beside Allah. Or the issue of tawheed is limited to don't, not to provoke or make dua for someone. Don't go to a grave and ask the grave to help you, to mm-hmm. the person in the grave to help you. Many people think that this is Tawheed. Tawheed has nothing to do with sins. Tawheed has nothing to do with your social life. Tawheed has nothing to do with political life. And this dichotomy or this separation continued until it became in some stages as a complete separation. As if we are introducing a new secularism. Yes, it seems like a form of secularism, doesn't it? Uh, uh, exactly, mm-hmm. yes, exactly. Because, yes, he is muwahid, because he doesn't go to the grave. He doesn't make tawaf around graves. He doesn't make dua for certain awliya or for certain people. But maybe he is com- committing so many sins. This has nothing to do with tawhid according to this wrong understanding. Maybe this person in terms of behavior, he is very rude to people. He is not kind to his parents. He is not, again, on a political sphere, he is not uh, acting 
politically according to the rules and regulations of Sharia, and so on and so forth. Now, even this dichotomy on a political sphere, I know that might be, this might be a very delicate uh, subject. You know that some countries now, because they don't have these apparent shirk actions, such as uh, qubur, graves, and such as tawaf around the graves, but they are not bound by sharia in all their matters, in other matters, in other spheres, in their political life, in their economical life especially. And then people just call them that this is a country of tawheed because it is implementing these things. No. This is a distorted uh, meaning of tawheed. It is not the true meaning of tawheed. How come the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to establish Tawheed, Tawheed only in its narrow meaning that people do not make dua for dead people or for someone other than Allah Jalla wa ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about everything in our life. Prohibition of, from prohibition of riba, prohibition of zina, all the way unto removing something that harms people from the street. Mm-hmm. As you know, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-iman, bid'un wa sab'un shu'bah, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So, what is the true meaning of tawheed? The true meaning of tawheed is to submit to Allah jalla wa ala. Full submission to Allah jalla wa ala. And once the person, once the person submits to Allah jalla wa ala, full submission, then and then only mm-hmm. he will not be disobedient to Allah Jalla wa'ala in any sphere in his life. I think this is an excellent opportunity for us to take a break and we'll come back and speak more about this classification or this uh, clearing of what real Tawheed is. Uh, we're going to go to a, a short break and inshallah return in a couple of minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Back to the Prophet. Join Sheikh Amar in the program Back to the Prophet, wherein he teaches us practical lessons from the Prophet's life and how this can help us to overcome our challenges in the present. We talk about the life example of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, seeking guidance for ourselves. In the early days after the revelation of the Holy Quran, the Muslims were greatly persecuted, so much so that Quite a few Muslims had to leave Arabia and migrate to Africa to live among Ahl Kitab, Christian people who followed the Gospel of Christ. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Living in the West. Sheikh, just before the break, you spoke about something which is very interesting. I think many of the viewers and even myself, it's something new to us really, to tell you the truth, is the understanding of Tawheed. Now you said it's not really just something on a very personal level, but it encompasses so many other things. Could you expand on, upon this a bit more, Sheikh? Okay, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You know the issue of Tawheed. This understanding that we have understood that or so many people understood, is a very limited understanding of Tawheed. And there is no proof to support that understanding. And actually, all the proofs are against this understanding. Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, in his book, At-Tawheed, he said in the first chapter, Babu man haqqaq at-Tawheed dakhal al-Jannah bi ghayri hisab. Or Babu man haqqaq at-Tawheed and he mentioned some of the ahadith that talk about, for example, hadith Muslim. Man qala la ilaha illallah, dakhal al-jannah. Or, so the one who says la ilaha illallah enters paradise. Enters paradise. In some other narrations, Allah Jalla wa ala will protect him, will save him from the hellfire. And there are many ahadith that talk about this. Mm-hmm. 
just by establishing La ilaha illallah or by saying actually mm-hmm. La ilaha illallah, the person will be saved and protected from the hellfire. Mm-hmm. Subhanallah. And Hadith Mu'ad tell the people behind this wall the one who establishes La ilaha illallah, he will be saved from the hellfire. So what does that mean? Is, does that mean the one who just say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al-Rasulullah, and that's all? No. We know for a fact that salah is one of the pillars of al-Islam. Sawm is the third pillar. Giving zakah is the fourth pillar. Performing hajj is the fifth pillar. We all know that there are many other obligations to be kind to your parents, Mm -hmm. to be kind to people, not to lie and to be a trustworthy person, etc. Now, abandoning kabair, the major sins, the major sins, Mm -hmm. riba, and uh, slandering people, the kabair, the seven kabair mentioned in the hadith, and the other kabair like a zina etc. Those also are part of or encompassed in Al-Islam. So, so if we take this, mm-hmm. if we take this off together, okay. what is the difference between Tawheed and Al-Islam? No, actually Al-Islam is Tawheed. Tawheed is Al-Islam. But the problem is that some people, when they start to classify or the scholars in the past, when they st- try to classify Islamic sciences. So they said this is Tawheed and this is Fiqh. This is, for example, uh, Ulum Aqeedah. This is Lugha Arabiya, etc. As a matter of classification, it is not a real matter. In reality, Tawheed is linked to Fiqh. Fiqh goes back to Tawheed, etc. So these are all interlinked it's, it's only because of the classifications that now it's been taken as something separate. yes now let us go back to the statement of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab the one who verifies Tawheed the one who implements Tawheed in its totality in his life دخل الجنة بغير حساب سبحان الله he entered Jannah without any without accounting. any accountability without mm-hmm. being held accountable for what he did mm-hmm. سبحان الله how come he said in the explanation, Sulaiman, Sheikh Sulaiman said in Taysir al Aziz al Hamid, yes, because this person he submitted to Allah Jawalla fully, completely, perfectly. So this person he glorified Allah Jalla He fears Allah Jalla mm-hmm. He loves Allah Jalla Means he has implemented Tawheed fully. To the extent that he will not go against the will of Allah Jalla wa'ala. He does not want to displease Allah Jalla wa'ala in any point in his life. So this person, because of that level of implementation of Tawheed, he will never commit sins. So what about Shaykh? Uh, yeah, just let, let me, let me okay, complete this, this point. So this person, because of that level of implementation of Tawheed, mm-hmm which includes love and fear of Allah Jalla wa'ala all together, this person will not commit any single sin. Moreover, take the hadith of Ukasha, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned about those who established tawakkul. Mm-hmm. And they established tawakkul to the highest level. We don't want to get into that. But a highest level of tawakkul. That's reliance upon Allah. Subhanahu reliance of Allah, uh, on Allah Jalla wa'ala. Mm-hmm. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, and this, is, this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, that they will get into Jannah without any accountability. So, they, once they just implement tawakkul, they will get into Jannah without accountability. Yes, because they cannot reach that level unless they have this amount of love to Allah Jalla wa'ala, this amount of fear from Allah Jalla wa'ala, this amount of reliance on Allah Jalla wa'ala, so these people will never commit silly sins. And even if they commit these silly sins, they will have an immense amount of seeking the forgiveness of Allah Jalla wa'ala and repentance and tawbah. So that sin will be wiped out. 
So those people will go to Jannah without any accountability. Those people are the same who are implementing Tawheed. So those who implement Tawheed, not only they will never commit sins, major sins, and if they commit minor sins, immediately they will ask the forgiveness of Allah Jalla wa ala. Not only that, but also they will implement other branches of faith, such as this high level of tawakkul or reliance, dependence on Allah Jalla wa ala. And that, that also can be understood, or this, this leads to the, uh, the meaning of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hadith Ukasha, that once they rely, once they depend on Allah Jalla wa ala, and they reach that level, they will get into Jannah without uh, accountability. So uh, I was going to stop you earlier on, but I'm, I'm just going to put this in there, Sheikh. There's a hadith of Mu'ad ibn Jabal where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, whoever... Okay, doesn't make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will enter paradise. And then the Mu'adz asks uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that even the one who commits zina or the one who steals. So um, yes. how, do you okay. put, how do you put this together now? Yeah, the, the, this hadith is a well-known hadith. Mm. Hadith Mu'ad ibn Jabal in a sahihain. Mm-hmm. He came to the Prophet sallallahu oh, alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was wearing white clothes and he was lying on his bed. Sorry. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, he stood up or he sat and then he told him the one who does not commit shirk he will be entered to Jannah. Then Mu'ad ibn Jabal was surprised. He said, Wa in zana wa in sarak? Sorry, uh, Abu Dhar. Hmm. He said, Wa in zana wa in sarak? Then the Prophet Sallallahu said, Wa in zana wa in sarak? Even if he commits zina and he steals. Then he was surprised, Abu Dhar. And then he asked the, same, the second time and the third time. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَإِن زَنَا وَإِن سَرَقْ بِرَغْمِ أَنْفِ أَبِي ذَرْ Means whether Abu Dhar is heavy, happy or uh-huh. he is unhappy. Hmm. This person will get into Jannah. Many people misunderstood this hadith. And they think that just establishing Tawheed will prevent the person from being in the hellfire. No, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here mentioned that he will get into Jannah at the end of the day. He will be punished for whatever he commits or for whatever he committed in his dunya, but at the end of the day, he is not considered to be kafir and he will get into Jannah. This is the correct understanding of the hadith. And some people might say, who said that this is the the correct understanding of this hadith? That this person established established, uh, tawheed, but have other sins, then this person means he will be purified in the hellfire and he will go to hellfire for some time and then he will leave. Why don't we say that this person will go to Jannah directly because this might be understood from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. Some people might say this and in, in this hadith, maybe as you know, maybe we don't have enough time to discuss this. Mm-hmm. There are two extremes in understanding this hadith and many other similar ahadith such as man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala al-jannah or man qala la ilaha illallah harramahu allahu ala an-nar one extreme is the extreme of khawarij and one extreme is, uh, and the opposite extreme is the extreme of murja the khawarij says the khawarij say if the person commits a sin then he major a major sin he then he left the fold of al-islam and this person will be thrown in the hell fire he is kafir. On the other hand, the murja says, the murja say, if the person commits sins, but he still believes in Allah Jalla wa ala, then he is still a believer and he will not get into the hellfire. The, uh, the opinion or the principle, the correct understanding of these ahadith is the understanding of the people of As-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which is if the person doesn't commit a major shirk, then this person will go to Jannah even if he commits zina, etc., as per hadith Abi Dhar. So, but this, what, what is the support for this understanding? We know for fact there are numerous ahadith that talk about Ahl al Kaba'ir and that the people of major sins, that they will be purified in the hellfire before they enter, before they enter paradise. Okay, Jazakallah, Sheikh I think that's an excellent point where we just stopped on there, where we just understand the whole concept of Tawheed. Well, 
I hope all of you are taking notes. A very important topic. In the next episode, I think we're going to look at what really is this Tawheed and this Abad. Inshallah, I'll leave you with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.